اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم I begin in the name of the Almighty God, the compassionate, the merciful, the one who has created everything in utmost perfection. And may the peace and blessings of the Almighty God be upon His pure and beloved messenger, the peak of His creation, the symbol of humanity, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And his pure, immaculate progeny of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, especially the leader of our time, the awaited Savior, Al Imam Al Mahdi, Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Farajah. May God hasten his reappearance and make us all amongst his sincere and dedicated servants. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala states in the Holy Quran, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ فِي لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ خَيْرٌ مِّنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرِ صدق الله العلي العظيم Illuminate your hearts and minds with a very loud salawat. The greatest night out of the year is the night of Qadr, the night of power or the night of destiny. According to the Holy Quran, this night is equivalent, not equivalent, it's better. Khayrun. It has more virtues, it has more benefits, it's greater than 1000 months. That's about 80 years or so. That's 30,000 days. Every good deed, every act on Laylatul Qadr is better than 30,000 days of deeds and worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Indeed, the most miserable human being is the one who does not take advantage of this divine opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to humankind. Imagine if in your society, it is announced that the daily wage, which is let's say about $100 a day, let's say that's the average daily income, that's multiplied by 30,000. Three nights out of the year, one night out of the year, one day out of the year, the wage, instead of it being $100, you multiply it by 30,000, making it 3 million. What do you think would happen? How would people treat that day? How would people treat that night? You work one night, you work one day, you get $3 million. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is multiplying our deeds because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the all merciful, He's the all generous. He just wants a way to give us. The true believer is the one who takes advantage of such a night, who seeks closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on such a night. Laylatul Qadr khayrun min al shahr. The night of Qadr is better than 1000 months. When we think of Laylatul Qadr, it is important for us to think of the significance of this night. First of all, what happened on Laylatul Qadr? What is the major event that happened? We know that the Holy Quran was revealed on Laylatul Qadr. Because the Holy Quran is very clear that Allah brought down the Holy Quran on Laylatul Qadr. How do we understand that though? Because we know that the Quran came down in a, throughout a period of 23 years. The Quran had two stages. The first stage is the apparent stage in which it was revealed throughout a period of 23 years. Since 27th of Rajab, the year of the Mab'ath, until the Prophet ﷺ passed away. The Qur'an would come down gradually. A few chapters here, a few verses there. Now why? Why was that the case? Some unbelievers, they objected to the Prophet. 
They said, why is it that you receive a few verses here and there? Lawla unzila alayhi al-Qur'an jumlatan wahida. Why is it not the case that the Qur'an is revealed to him at once? The Qur'an says, كَذَلِكَ لِنُثَبِّتَ بِهِ فُعَادَكَ One primary reason is to strengthen the hearts of the Holy Prophet. Remember the Prophet, he experienced difficult challenges. So every few days when the evil doers would create new obstacles, they would harass the Prophet, they would violate him, they would violate Muslims. Every few days, the Holy Quran is revealed to the heart of the Prophet and this strengthened his heart. That's number one. Number two, to strengthen the hearts of the Muslims. There would be battles, there would be difficult challenges. So when the Muslims felt that God is really watching over them, with every event, there are some verses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is monitoring everything. This strengthened their heart. It made them really believe that God is with them. Because with every event, God has something to say. There is new advice. There is a new idea. And this is the miracle of the Holy Quran. Had it come down at once, it would not have this effect. So this was the first stage of the Quran. But the more important stage is that Allah revealed the Quran on Laylatul Qad to the Prophet's heart in the beginning. So all of the Quran came down to the Prophet's heart in one night on Laylatul Qad. And then throughout a period of 23 years, the Prophet would receive verses again to deliver to the people. The Quran was revealed on Laylatul Qadr. Now many people ask the question, what is the meaning of Laylatul Qadr? The night of power, the night of destiny, fuse several translations here. What does Laylatul Qadr mean? There are three meanings for Laylatul Qadr. The first one is the night of destiny or determination. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala determines something. Why is it called Laylatul Qadr? Listen to this very carefully. Everything that will happen to us, to me, to you, from now till the next year in the month of Ramadan, till the next Laylatul Qadr is written tonight. It's determined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tonight. The sustenance that you will receive, the kind of job that you will have, how much money you will make, it will be determined tonight. Whether you will live till the following year, it will be determined tonight. Whether you will be healthy or sick, all the events that will happen till the following year, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala determines them tonight. Realize how crucial and significant this night is. That God is determining everything for us. And He's given us an opportunity to play a role in that. The more you open your heart tonight, the more you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will write for you a better year. We have till Fajr, till dawn. At dawn, everything will be written for us. But what God is going to write for us depends on what we do this night. How much we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on such a night. This is one important factor that will determine what God will write for us. This is one meaning of Qadr. The second meaning of Qadr means sha'an, status. It's the night of great status. According to one verse in the Holy Quran, وَمَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ We see the same word being used. The unbelievers or the ignorant ones, they did not do justice to the status of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They did not do justice to the high, glorious status of God. Laylatul Qadr has a very high status and that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose this night for the Qur'an to be revealed on. So it's the night of great status. Laylatul Qadr means the night of great status. That's the second meaning. The third meaning means constriction. Something that's tight. What does that have to do with Laylatul Qadr? 
One hadith explains. One hadith says the angels of God, and God knows how many angels He's created. They descend on the earth on such a night, such that there is no longer any room on earth for the angels. That's how crowded the earth becomes with the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. تَضِيقُ الْأَرْضُ بِالْمَلَائِكَةِ Al-Qadr comes from something that's tight, something that's constricted. For example, in Surah Al-Fajr, we see there's one verse that uses Al-Qadr in this meaning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the human being when Allah straightens his rizq, his sustenance, meaning God constricts it, he limits it. فَقَدَرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقَهِ فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي أَهَانًا When God tests the human being, He reduces His sustenance, the human being accuses God of humiliating him. Oh God, you've humiliated me. Why have you put me through this test? So the Qur'an uses this word in this meaning. These are three meanings of Laylatul Qadr. And remember these meanings as the night wears on, to motivate you to take advantage of every single minute and every single second. There is one very important aspect of Laylatul Qadr that I would like to share with you. According to the Ahadith of Ahl al-Bayt, you know what the best action is on Laylatul Qadr? Yes, Salah is very important. Dua al-Jawshan is amazing. The three surahs that we'll be reciting these are all great acts. But the hadith tells us that the most important act on Laylatul Qadr is to increase your ma'rifah and knowledge. If you gain some knowledge on Laylatul Qadr, in the eyes of God, that has value more than your salah, more than your other a'mal. Let's spend a few minutes here to increase our ma'rifah in a figure of Islam who's linked with Laylatul Qadr. And Imam al-Sadiq in one hadith, he was asked, what is the meaning of Qadr? What is Al-Qadr, Laylatul Qadr? What is it? You know what the Imam salam told him? The Imam salam says, Laylatul Qadr Fatimah wa man arafa haqqaha adraka Laylatul Qadr. Allahu Akbar. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. The Imam salam says, Laylatul Qadr, the essence of it is Fatima alayhi salam. And the one who can come to know the right of Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam, he has grasped the essence of Laylatul Qadr. وَإِنَّمَا سُمِّيَتْ فَاطِمَ لِأَنَّ الْخَلْقَ فُطِمُوا عَنْ مَعْرِفَتِهَا She's named Fatima because Fatima means something that's cut off. What does that mean? The Imam says, because the creation people have been cut off from knowing her. That's how high her status is, that people don't know her. They're cut off from knowing her. Except the very few believers who know the status of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. Now what's the relationship between Fatima al-Zahra and Laylatul Qadr? What does she have to do with Laylatul Qadr? Listen to this very carefully, brothers and sisters. Laylatul Qadr, what is it? What happened on Laylatul Qadr? It's a temporal container for the revelation of God. Meaning, when you examine the revelation of God, what was the timing of it? Laylatul Qadr, the revelation of God, the Wahi, the Holy Quran, came down on Laylatul Qadr. So Laylatul Qadr is like a container that contained the revelation of God in terms of time. It's a temporal container. That's what Laylatul Qadr is. When you go examine the traditions of Ahl al-Bayt, we know that the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt, they had the deeper knowledge of the Qur'an, the ta'wil of the Qur'an, right? Because the Qur'an has tafsir, the apparent meaning, and then it has the ta'wil, the deeper layers and depths of the Qur'an. Doesn't the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says that the Qur'an, every verse of it has 70 layers behind it? The Imams of Ahlul Bayt, how did they get their knowledge of Ta'wil of Qur'an? 
Yes, a lot of it was passed down from the Prophet ﷺ, through Imam Ali السلام, through the Imams. But what was their major source of knowing the inner depths and layers of the Holy Quran? Al Imam al Sadiq السلام, in one hadith he explains to us. He says, after the Holy Prophet ﷺ, he passed away, Fatima السلام, she became so grief, grievous, so depressed, so sorrowful and sad for the departure of her father, such that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to comfort her. He sent the angels to Fatima. They would speak to her and they would comfort her. Now some may think, you know, this is taking it a little bit too far. How can you say that Fatima, who's not a prophet, the angels speak to her? Doesn't Quran tell us about Maryam alayhi salam and the angels would speak to Maryam alayhi salam? Qalat al malaika ya Maryam, inna Allah astafaki wa tahharaki wa astafaki ala nisa'i al alameen. Ya Maryam uqnuti li rabbiki wa sjudi wa arka'i ma'ar raka'in. The Quran is very clear that Maryam alayhi salam, she was not a prophet. Maryam was not a prophet. But she had a great status. The angels spoke to her. They told her, God has chosen you over the women. Fatima al-Zahra is the daughter of the Prophet. He says, she's a part of me. She's a part of the greatest messenger of God. The angels would come, they would speak to her. And they would tell her about the ta'wil of the Quran. And she would have Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam write it in a book. This book reached the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. And this was a major source of their knowledge. So just as the Holy Quran, when it comes to the time of revelation, Laylatul Qadr is the container. Fatima al-Zahra alayha salam was the container of the meanings and the depths of the Holy Quran. Let's appreciate Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. This amazing gem that God gave to humanity. This is one way of understanding the link. Another way of understanding the link between Laylatul Qadr and Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. Some scholars have noted that we have a hadith that say, after your wajib salah, your obligatory prayers, if you do tasbihat al-Zahra, we all know what tasbihat al-Zahra is, right? Where after your salat, highly recommended to say 34 times Allahu Akbar, 33 times Alhamdulillah, 33 times Subhanallah. The hadith says if you do that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will multiply the reward of your salah by 1000 times. Laylatul Qadr multiplies your deeds by over a thousand times. It's better than a thousand months. And the tasbih of Fatima alayhi salam multiplies the reward of your salah by 1,000 times. A third way of understanding the link, Laylatul Qadr is hidden from us, right? We don't know exactly which night it is. Most likely, it's tonight, the night of the 23rd. But it could be any night out of the last 10 days of Ramadan, especially the 19th, 21st, 23rd, 27th. One of these nights. But it's been hidden from us. Why? Because it has such a sacred value. When something is so special, it's hidden, right? The treasures, aren't they hidden? The perils, aren't they hidden under the sea? Valuable things are not out there for everyone. They're hidden. Laylatul Qadr has a high status in God. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to hide it. So we appreciate it, know its value. And so Allah encourages us to worship Him on other nights. Because if the Prophet would tell Muslims, Laylatul Qadr is this night, people would only worship that night. Allah wanted us to take advantage of the month of Ramadan by worshiping Him on several nights. Just as Laylatul Qadr is hidden from us, we see that not only the status of Fatima, but the grave of Fatima alayhi salam is also hidden from us. The daughter of the Prophet. He had only one daughter at the time. Now there are a few differences of opinion. Maybe he had several other daughters or stepdaughters. How many daughters did he have like Fatima alayhi salam? 
You go to Medina, you see the graves of the companions, the wives of the Prophet, everything is there. People know it, it's marked, we know where their graves are. Except one woman, and that's Lady Fatima Zahra Zahra. Her grave is hidden till this very day. Why? Allah wants us to go and research on what happened to her. So we can find out her status and from whom we should take our religion. A final way of understanding the relationship between the Knights of Power and Fatima Zahra Zahra we see that Laylatul Qadr represents the link between God and His Prophet through revelation. How did God communicate to humanity and send them a divine book? How did God send His Prophet with a message? On Laylatul Qadr, He sent a book, right? So Laylatul Qadr is the link between God and prophethood. Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam is the link between the Prophet and Imam, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. And they're equally as important. Just as the Prophet brought the religion for us, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt protect the religion for us. And who was that link between Rasulullah and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt? Who was the link? Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam because the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, they come from her line. On such a night, remember Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam and the rights that she has over this ummah because for a thousand four hundred years she's been marginalized and oppressed by the Muslim ummah. If you want to see closeness to Allah and reach the essence of Laylatul Qadr, as Al Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam says, the more you know Fatima, the more you've achieved Laylatul Qadr and reached the status of Laylatul Qadr. On such a night, the angels descend. All of the angels or most of the angels of God descend. What do they do? What do the angels do? Yes, it's a blessing for us that God is dispatching all those angels down to earth. But what do the angels do? What's on earth? What's special about earth, by the way? You see the Holy Quran speaks about the universe, the stars, the moon, the galaxies. This world is so small compared to the universe. It's just a speck in the universe, planet Earth. Why is it so important? Why does the Holy Quran focus so much on Earth? You know why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, قَالَ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً The reason that planet Earth is so special, it's because the Khalifa of God, the Hujja of God, the proof of God is on planet Earth. That's why there's so much attention on planet earth. Because it's the place for the hujja of God, the proof of God, the representative of God, the vicegerent of God. The angels on such a night, they descend, descend, descend to come and meet the hujja of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They carry our books of actions and they offer it to the hujja of our time for him to review the actions and for him to finalize the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us till next year. The Holy Quran does not say only one time it happened. Tanazzalat in the past tense. No. The Holy Quran uses the continuous tense of the word. Tatanazzalu. It means it's always happening every year on Laylatul Qadr. The angels descend to go to pledge allegiance to the Imam of our time. At the time of the Prophet, he was the Imam. He was the Hujjah of God. And today, the Hujjah of God upon which all the angels of God descend upon is Al-Imam Al-Mahdi Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Faraja. On such a night, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi witnesses our actions. Yes, seven billion people, what they've done. The Imam السلام, witnesses our actions. Now some people object to this. I remember once a friend, when we were talking about this, he found this objectionable and he told me, look, Sayyid, please, I mean, you're taking this too far. 
Yes, the Imam has a high status, but for you to say that a human being, because after all the Imam is a human being, for him to know what 7 billion people are doing, come on, that's exaggeration there. You're taking things a little bit too far. I asked him a question, I told him, let me ask you a question. Do you believe shaitan exists? Satan? He says, yes, the Quran is very clear that Satan exists. I told him, what does Satan do? What's his job? What does he have to do with us human beings? He says, he whispers to us, so he misguides us. I told him, Satan, when he's whispering to us to misguide us, does he see our actions or no? He thought for a moment, he says, yeah, obviously he sees our actions. I told him, not, does he, not only does he see our actions, he can even read our mind, right? Because he sees your intention. How is he going to whisper to you if he doesn't know what your intentions are? I have an intention to donate. I have an intention to pray. I have an intent to, intention to, to do something good. If shaitan can't see your intention, can't read your mind, in other words, how is he going to whisper to you for you not to do it? He says, okay, so what? So the shaitan can see our actions. I told him, subhanallah, you accept that the enemy of God, shaitan, has this power. He can see 7 billion people, what they're doing, and he can read their minds. But the hujjah of God, the friend of God, the representative of God, he can't. Allah will give our enemy this capability and this capacity, but he's not going to give this capacity to his hujjah and his proof and the imam who's he chosen for us. This is absurd, this is ridiculous. People act, do whatever you want. Allah will see your actions. His messenger, and the mu'minun are who? According to the ahadith, they're the imams of Ahlul Bayt. They witness our actions, and on such a night, our imam witnesses our actions. On such a night, take some time, Take a few moments to turn to the Imam of your time. He's your Imam. He's the Hujjah of God. Ask Him for Shafa'a. Ask Him to intercede on your behalf with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more you do so, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will determine a blessed year for you. This is the greatness of Laylatul Qadr, brothers and sisters. It's a night in which we bring this sinful heart, this blackened heart. Throughout the year, we blacken this heart. We blacken and pollute and contaminate the soul. On Laylatul Qadr, it's the night where we bring this heart. We bring our souls and we wash them with repentance. We wash them with ibadah. By going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By repenting sincerely, not just any repentance. The Holy Quran says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O believers, Tubu ilallahi tawbatan nasuha. When you're repenting to God, be sincere with your tawbah. We human beings, we're not really sincere when we deal with other people. On the outside, I have one appearance, but in my heart there's something else. There are some people that we deceive. We deceive them. They don't know what's really in our hearts. What we're doing against them. How we're talking against them. How we conspire against them. People don't see that. People don't see what's in your heart. Just as sometimes we deceive others, the human being all the time deceives himself. The most person that we deceive is not others, it's ourselves. We're not sincere with ourselves. We, de we deceive ourselves. On the nights of Jum'ah, Laylatul Jum'ah, we come for Dua Kumail. We repent to Allah. On Laylatul Qadr, we repent to Allah. And that's great. But deep down in our hearts, oftentimes we deceive ourselves because we're not really sincere about the toba. Yes, I'm begging God to forgive me, but deep down in my heart, I still want to go back to those sins and habits. 
I have not made a true determination to move away from sins. Tubu ilallahi tawbatan nasuha. On such a night, try to be honest with yourself. Yes, you say astaghfirullah and you're trying to repent, but deep down in your heart, do you really want to uproot the sins from your life or no? Or you want to continue fulfilling your desires and temptations? It's very difficult. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will bless the heart that's truly repenting. Once, according to one hadith, Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he was passing in the desert, he passed by a man. This man was praying and he was crying his heart out, his tears overflowing his face. Ya Allah, forgive me. Ya Allah, forgive me. Musa alayhi salam, he felt bad for him. He told him, oh Allah, I don't want to object to you, but if I were in your position, let's say, I would have forgiven him. You see how he's crying. You know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Musa? Inshallah, this doesn't apply to us, but you know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Musa? Allah told him, oh Musa, I looked at his heart. Yes, he's crying now. He's trying to repent now. But I saw his heart. If right now, a woman passes by in front of him and he has the opportunity to sin with her, he would sin. So this tawbah of his has no value. Now he's sitting in the masjid crying and he's praying and he's turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah, if he knows in my heart tomorrow, I'll go back to backbiting and slandering and haram looks and hearing things that anger Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and creating fitna in my family, disrespecting my parents, not raising my children properly, associating with bad friends. Allah, will He bless me fully? On such a night, brothers and sisters, squeeze yourself to be sincere. Truly try to be sincere. Make the determination in your heart Oh Allah, if the world goes upside down, I will not go back to that sin. If the whole world stands against me, I will not compromise and I will not go back to the sin. Instill this courage and power in your heart. That's true tawbah. Repentance requires courage. It requires that you're brave and you stand up to your sin. Your sin is like an enemy who is about to attack you. Stand up to him. Be brave and courageous. This is how we repent on Laylatul Qadr, brothers and sisters. We keep insisting and insisting on our sins. Year after year, we insist on our sins. Why is it that we insist on our sins? One primary reason, and this is important for the families, is because many of us, we grew up in families who really didn't care about sinning, they were not so concerned. A child grows up in a house, the father is sinning every day, the mother is sinning, the father lies, he cheats, he deceives others, he's not a good role model. The mother, the same, she's sinning, she doesn't wear the hijab, she listens to music, she goes and dances in wedding ceremonies. And the child is growing up, he's seeing these figures. Of course, this child will neglect his responsibilities and for him, a sin will be something common. You know, the most place, the most important place that makes sins for us common is our families, is our homes. When we grow up in a house in which the parents really don't care, they're neglectful. For them, it's just a sin. It's not the end of the world, big deal. When you teach your child that, that it's not a big deal. A child will grow up thinking that it's okay to sin. It's not a big deal. We need to be careful with whom we associate, brothers and sisters. Sometimes it's our friends. You see that parents, they spend so much time, they raise a child, give him the best upbringing, but because he goes and he associates with bad, evil friends, he undoes all of that work that his parents did. And this is a great act of injustice to the parents. You go and associate with friends who teach you nothing but evil acts. 
nothing but bad habits or just a waste of time. And they make sins for us easy. Some friends, all they do is they encourage you to sin. Stay away from these friends. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, in his munajat in Masjid al-Kufa, when he asks and he says, Ilahi wa as'aluka al-aman. Oh Allah, I ask you for safety. He recites the verse about bad friends. What does he say? Ilahi wa as'aluka al-aman. Listen to the words of Ali ibn Abi Talib. يَوْمَ يَعُضُّ الظَّالِمُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِ اتَّخَذْتُ مَعَ الرَّسُولِ سَبِيلًا Oh Allah, I ask you for safety on that day of judgment when the evil one, the oppressor, he shall bite at his hands out of regret and pain. What will he say? What is he regretful about? I wish I would not have associated with these bad friends. Ya waylata laytani lam attakhid fulanan khalila لقد أضلني عن الذكر بعد إذ جاءني. I wish I would not have befriended so and so. This person, that person. The truth was there. The path of guidance was there, but I did not pay attention to it. This is one reason why we continue to sin, because we associate with bad friends. Bad friends can change everything. There was a sister in the States, after all those years, she was convinced of wearing the hijab. She went back home to the Middle East. Some friends over there, instead of encouraging her and congratulating her that you in America, you wear the hijab, you know what they did? Are you backwards? What have you done? Take off the hijab. They pressured her, peer pressure, peer pressure, she took off the hijab. Imagine her parents suffering in this country, suffering because of all the efforts that they had to exert to have their daughter wear hijab. A few bad friends undid all of them. Parents, be careful. Your children, with what type of friends they associate with? This is extremely dangerous. We should teach our friends, our children, that a sin is a big deal. Yes, Allah is merciful, but a sin is a big deed. One hadith says that one of the qualities of the hypocrites of the munafiq is that when they commit a sin, it's like a fly. A fly that comes and you wave the fly away. And for the believer, when he commits a sin, it's like the mountain of Abi Qubais on his chest. We're defying the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's one reason why people sin. Another reason why people sin is because we have no haya before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have no shame before God. In front of everyone in society, we have shame. Many of the things we do, we don't do it in front of others. I swear to God, sometimes if a child is looking at us, we don't do something. But before Allah, we do everything because that shame is not there. We fear our parents, our society, everyone else except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam, what does he say in dua Abi Hamza? Ilahi ana al-lazhi lam astahyika fi al-khala wa lam uraqibka fi al-mala. Oh Allah, I'm the one whom when I'm in my private home, in my private room, I have no shame, I do whatever I want. أنا صاحب الدواهي العظمى أنا الذي على سيده اجترى. On these nights, brothers and sisters, let's turn to Allah. Let's have shame before the Almighty God. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is merciful. Yes, Allah is merciful. That's why He's given us such a night. One time, Al Hassan Al Basri, in front of Zain Al Abidin alayhi salam, he said, "I'm surprised." at those people who end up going to heaven, how do they go to heaven? I'm surprised, it's so difficult. How do people go to heaven? You know what Imam Zain al-Abidin told him? 
He told him, no, if you ask the Ahlul Bayt, we'll tell you. He says, I'm surprised at the one who goes to hell. How did he go to hell? When there is such a merciful Lord. Hold on to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the one who covers our sins, who's willing to let go. Allah is willing to forgive every sin. According to one hadith, once Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he was in the desert with his people, and there was a drought, there was no rain. He prayed to Allah, oh Allah, send down the rain. Allah told him, oh Musa, there is a sinful man in your group, a sinful man, because of him I will not send the rain. Because of this man's sins. Musa stood up, he told them, Oh my people, one person from you is blocking the rain. Allah will not send the rain because of this person. Please stand up and leave so Allah sends the rain down upon us. We're going to starve with this drought. Imagine what happened to that man. Put yourself in his shoes. We're all sinful people. This could happen to us. That man, he wished the earth would swallow him. He went into sujood and from the bottom of his heart, he repented to Allah, Oh Allah, please don't expose me. In front of everyone, please don't expose me. Suddenly the clouds came, Jibra'il came and he told him, Oh Musa, Allah is sending the rain. He says, Jibra'il, but the man, he did not get up. He did not leave. Why is God sending the rain? Jibra'il told him, this man repented. Allah accepted his tawbah. So Allah is sending the rain now. Musa asked Jibra'il, Jibra'il, who is he? Which, who's this man? Let me know him. Jibra'il told him, when he was sinful, we did not expose him. Now that he repented, we're going to tell you who he is. We're not going to tell you who he is. That's how merciful Allah is. He won't even reveal this person to Prophet Musa. Because he truly repented. On such a night, let's go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the King of the universe, the merciful Lord. On such a night, let's go back to Allah. Let's read the du'as and munajat. Listen to what Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam says. Ilahi albasatni al-khataya thawba madallati Oh Allah, my sins have caused me to wear the garment of shame, humiliation. My sins have humiliated me, oh Allah. Oh Allah, my huge sin has caused my heart to die. Now I have a dead heart. فَأَحِيهِ بِتَوْبَةٍ مِنْكَ يَا أَمَلِي وَبُغْيَتِي Oh Allah, revive my heart through tawbah, through repentance. That's how we revive the heart. Let's turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on such a night, brothers and sisters. Let's cry because the hadith says every eye on the day of judgment will cry except three eyes. One eye which lowers its gaze from that which is haram. One eye which cries out of fear and love for God. And one eye which cries for Abi Abdullah al Hussein. On such a night, one of the most recommended acts is to visit Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Let's remember Aba Abdullah al Hussein. It's one of the most recommended acts. One hadith tells us from history that once the Prophet, he was in his room. When Umm Salama, she came, the Prophet told her, please close the door and make sure no one comes in. This is some private meditation time for the Prophet. She closed the door after a while, Imam al Hussein, he's a young child, he slipped into the room. Um Salama, she felt bad because the Prophet says, make sure no one comes into my room. She goes into the room to see what's happening. She sees Al Hussein sitting on the chest of Rasulullah. And the tears of the Prophet are coming down his face crying. She tells him, Ya Rasulullah, why is it that you're crying? 
He tells her, oh, um, Salama, I was playing with my grandson Hussein. When Jibra'il descended upon me, he told me, Ya Rasulullah, do you love your son Hussein? I said, yes, Ya Jibra'il, I love my son Hussein. He told me, oh, Ya Rasulullah, let me tell you something, something I don't understand. Why is it that in moments when the Prophet, he would be happy with an Imam al Hussein playing with him every time Jibra'il has to come and tell him about the tragic event. He tells him, Ya Rasulullah, let me tell you what your Ummah will do to Abi Abdullah. They shall slaughter him in Karbala. And this is why I'm crying. I'm crying for my grandson Hussein. Yes, every tear that you shed for Abi Abdullah on the Day of Judgment will be a source of mercy for us.